Welcome and thank you for attending the Black History Matters series presented by the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum. My name is Victoria Basturto and I am a current senior at Colgate University located in Hamilton, New York. I am also an intern working with the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum this year. And I will be facilitating the presentation of 28 videos that, we, that will be released throughout the month of February of 2021 and that you can view on our YouTube channel or on our website. I will now lead you through some introductory statements. The National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum is located in Peterborough, New York, in the building that you can see on the screen where the inaugural meeting of the New York State Anti-Slavery Society was held in 1835. Nahoff's mission is as follows. The National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum honors anti-slavery abolitionists, their work to end slavery and the legacy of that struggle, and strives to complete the second and ongoing abolition, the moral conviction to end racism. Nehop has worked in coordination with the Garrett Smith Estate National Historic Landmark, which is also located in Peterborough, New York, to create the Black History Matters series. The following statement is the purpose of the Black History Matters series and you can read along on the screen as well. Nehoff supports racial justice movements seeking to address racial inequality given their resonance with Nehoff's mission to address the second ongoing abolition to end racism. Nehoff believes a significant number of Americans do not understand the current racial justice protest due to their unfamiliarity with four centuries of Black American history because this history was either excluded or taught inadequately in schools. Nehoff knows that education is a powerful step towards ending racism and that understanding the history of the enslavement and dehumanization of Black Americans provides critical context for the ongoing racial justice movements and the persistence of racism in America. Given Nehoff's commitment to strengthening knowledge of history as one route to confront racism, Nehoff will present Black History Matters a series of crash courses covering some examples of neglected topics in Black American history throughout the month of February of 2021. Now I'd like to welcome our presenter, Dr. McLaughlin. Dr. McLaughlin is Professor Emeritus of History at Casanova College and Vice President of the Cabinet of Freedom at the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum. Dr. McLaughlin served as Professor of History and Dean of the first year program at Casanova College in New York. His favorite course, Race, Rights and Resistance, was a seminar in Black history from the fight to end slavery to the ongoing struggle for equality with contemporary American society. Dr. McLaughlin was invited to become a member of the National Abolition Hall of Fame and Museum's Cabinet of Freedom in June of 2010 and was elected Vice President in 2012. He lives in Earville, New York and St. Simons, Georgia with his wife and dog. I'd like to now invite Dr. McLaughlin to begin his presentation on the Jim Crow Museum of Racist Memorabilia. Well, thank you for your introduction. Uh, let's begin with the word about Thomas Rice, the original Jim Crow, who is shown here in his stage outfit. In the 1830s, Rice appropriated a trickster figure, Jim Crow, and a song, Jump Jim Crow, from Black Slaves, blackened his face with burnt cork and became the most famous American blackface minstrel. The negative stereotyping of Black Americans at the heart of Rice's performances eventually became tied to the oppressive laws put into place throughout the South to restore and sustain white supremacy after the Civil War. Through minstrel shows and a whole variety of material objects, such as postcards, sculpture, and advertisements, Jim Crow poisoned social norms and customs around the United States with its racist message. Jim Crow is inseparable for the con from the concept of race. In the 1800s, pseudo-scientific concepts of race began to complement slaveholders' claims that slavery benefited Africans by civilizing them and bringing them to Christianity. These racial descriptions reinforce existing popular white beliefs about their superiority and the inferior qualities of other races. As Gates and Apia warn, when these concepts of race become set in stone, we cease to see actual human beings and instead look at other people through the 
consistent lens of racial prejudice. Images with distorted physical appearance and imagined personal traits replace the realities of Black American existence in the eyes of white America. These beliefs underlie the racist memorabilia that permeate America during the Jim Crow era and after. The Jim Crow Museum of Racist Memorabilia, located in Ferris State University, has amassed the nation's largest public collection of Jim Crow artifacts spanning the segregation era from Reconstruction until the Civil Rights Movement and beyond. The museum's founder, Dr. David Pilgrim, shown here with noted historian Henry Louis Gates, says these objects are so offensive, they should either be in a garbage can or in a museum. Well, the Jim Crow Museum uses these objects of intolerance to teach tolerance and promote social justice. Dr. Pilgrim kindly gave the National Abolition Hall of Fame permission to use museum images in this presentation. This is my interpretation of the museum's message. I highly recommend that you follow up this talk by paying a visit to the museum's website. Be warned, the images and some of the words in this presentation are highly offensive. Take a look and then as Dr. Pilgrim says, go out and do something positive. This is where we have to start. The word that sums up just about all the negative black stereotypes or caricatures created by white racists. A word so loathsome in its meanings and history that in contemporary America, it is frequently referred to as the N-word. Each of the caricatures we'll look at today, concepts such as Piccaninny, Brute, Tom, Mammy, Jezebel, and Mulatto, illustrate various aspects of its meaning. Despite their differences, each caricature carries the same overt message of Black inferiority. This message shows up in a variety of settings, ads like the one you see here, postcards, product packaging, sheet music covers, and much more. Jim Crow represents a transformation of the Southern slave society ended by the American Civil War. While Southerners portrayed enslaved Black Americans as docile and faithful servants, they lived in fear of the rebellious slave. This fear is represented by the gnat shown in this postcard who wanted nothing more than to slaughter his enslavers and whites in general. The name is inspired by Nat Turner, leader of the deadly 1831 rebellion. Under Jim Crow, the fear of black male violence evolves into the brute caricature, a violent black man who wants nothing more than to rape white women. The stereotype provided the motive for many of the 3,437 black Americans lynched by white mobs between 1882 and 1951. This bank combines several physical features associated with the brute, especially the combination of exaggerated lips and white teeth. The fancy hat and clothes contrasts with these racialized physical characteristics. This item is still available to purchase. A recent Google search turned up over 50 websites that had them on sale, described in one as an original American cast iron novelty money box to press lever on shoulder to raise arm to deposit coin in mouth, the eyes roll back. The most famous early example of the Piccaninny caricature, Topsy, in Uncle Tom's Cabin was intended by author Harriet Beecher Stowe to be a sympathetic character, a child corrupted by slavery. Running around on stage during minstrel shows, she became another example of how stereotype black characteristics such as laziness and shiftlessness were present at a very young age. As depicted on this music sheet cover, she's been made to look wild with frizzy braided hair barely contained by the ribbons. Here a young boy named Rastus exemplifies several related racial assumptions. First off, the boy is speaking what the advertiser considers a black version of the English language. Rastus is endorsing sweet potatoes, a food that blacks stereotypically are associated with almost as much as watermelons. Rastus has been out in the wild and caught an opossum to go along with sweet potatoes. Last off, only a black boy would be named Rastus. 
Picking any caricature showed up extensively in advertisements. The Gold Dust twins, Goldie and Dusty, appeared on packages of Fairbanks Gold Dust Washing Powder in 1892, which then became the nation's most popular washing powder in the 1900s. The twins stayed on the package until the 1950s and even spun off a popular 1920s radio show also called the Gold Dust Twins. The two stars were white performers who put on blackface for personal appearances and promotional photos. Here the Piccaninny is providing a service by holding up a thermometer. Male Piccaninnies were frequently depicted with big lips and bald head as we see here. As I said earlier, Jim Crow extended well beyond the South. My great grandfather from Chicago owned an exact duplicate of this thermometer that uh, much to my surprise, I inherited. As with Topsy, the Tom figure first shows up in Uncle Tom's cabin. Dependent upon whites for guidance and approval, dressed to serve, smiling and always helpful, but only semi-literate as shown by the message he holds up, the good qualities of cream of wheat that whites would be concerned about, its inexpensive cost and good taste are extolled by the Tom in this 1921 ad. As the museum puts it, Rastus happily serves breakfast to a nation. What we see here is a young version of the Tom caricature. The loyal Tom decked out as a bellboy, one of the service jobs commonly available to black men is letting his employer know that this brand of pencil sharpener is worth purchasing. Oddly enough, since Tom is recommending a pencil sharpener, this image appeared on ink blotter paper used to wipe off excess ink from fountain pens. The lawn jockey is one of the best known pieces of Jim Crow memorabilia. They come in two versions, the shorter and stockier Jocko that you see here and a taller, thinner Cavalier version. Jocko is wearing a jockey's outfit rather than the servant's gear worn in slave times. Why? Black rode the, blacks rode the winners of 15 of the first 28 Kentucky Derby races. The dominance of black jockeys ended just before World War I as whites brought Jim Crow norms into horse racing. Even more well-known than the lawn jockey is the mammy figure, instantly recognizable to most Americans even to this day. Fixing meals, cleaning the house, watching over the children, the mammy is the most supportive of all the caricatures, smiling, totally faithful to her white family, but portrayed as obese and asexual, although in reality, these women would likely have had children of their own. The Mammy figure began as a fictional counter to abolitionist portrayals of white men exploiting enslaved black women. The Mammy's lack of sex appeal guaranteed that she could care for white children without the sexual exploitation documented by abolitionists. Under Jim Crow, many black women with fewer other employment opportunities became domestic workers charged with raising white children. Conformity to the Mammy caricature, especially uh, through devotion to their white families, became an economic necessity. Mammies were used to sell all sorts of domestic products, but the one most recognized today has to be Aunt Jemima pancakes, promoted by a series of black women made up to look like the caricature. The historian Kimberly Wallace Sanders suggests that Aunt Jemima offered Northerners the Southern antebellum experience of having a mammy without actually participating in slavery. Racist product marketing helped spread the mammy caricature nationwide. The current owner of the Aunt Jemima brand, Quaker Oats, finally retired Aunt Jemima last year following the Black Lives Matter demonstrations. A company spokesman declared at long last that we recognize Aunt Jemima's origins are based on a racial stereotype. The advertisement for the 1960 film, I Passed for White, illustrates the tragic mulatto's desire to pass as white while concealing her black identity. Passing was a temptation for light-skinned black Americans. 
Exposure would bring rejection for the tragic mulatto from her white lover and other disastrous consequences. In the 1949 movie Pinky, a light-skinned black woman passes as white well up north. She is engaged to marry a white man who doesn't know who she, that she is black. Pinky comes south to visit Dicey, her black grandmother, and encounters a whole variety of troubles. In the movie Pinky, the white man wants her to return north with him, but Pinky chooses to stay in the south and manage property that she won in a lawsuit. The movie played through most of the South, showing that this caricature, at least, had lost some of its hold on white Southerners. Enslaved Black women were often portrayed by their enslavers as sexually promiscuous with an unending desire for white men. This caricature countered the reality of white men sexually exploiting and raping Black women throughout the South. Sexual exploitation continued under Jim Crow. This doll represents Josephine Baker, who in 1927 performed on a Parisian stage, Danse Sauvage, in a skirt of artificial bananas and not much of anything else. Baker became a star in France, a French citizen eventually, a hero of the French resistance against the Nazis, and a leader in the US civil rights movement. She can be considered a traditional figure leading to Pam Greer and others who played sexually aggressive but powerful women in movies like Foxy Brown, described on IMTV as a voluptuous black vigilante, takes a job as a high-class prostitute in order to get revenge on the mobsters who murdered her boyfriend. Jim Crow caricatures live on and racist memorabilia continues to be manufactured. The Jezebel figure shows up in modern pornography Eddie Murray played the pickaninny so successfully on Saturday Night Live that buckwheat became a slang term for black children. Aunt Jemima, as I said, just retired in 2020, soon to be followed by Uncle Ben. And as you can see, President Obama became and remains a target of white racists using Jim Crow memorabilia as their vehicle. So as I wind down this talk, we come full circle to Thomas Rice, the man who in 1830 got up on stage wearing blackface and performed Jim Crow. Politicians, fashion models, TV stars, online influencers, even the Dutch Christmas character Black Pete can still be found in blackface. As the Jim Crow Museum puts it, the battle continues. Objects with racist themes are created, produced and sold weekly in the United States. In some instances, the objects or images are racially insensitive or demeaning in direct ways. In other cases, their racist meanings are more nuanced. The only redeeming value for all of these objects and images is that they can be used to teach tolerance and promote social justice. I urge you to visit the Jim Crow Museum to learn more. As you see here, there are a number of places on their website that I would recommend that you visit. I'd like to thank Dr. McLaughlin for that educational presentation. If you're interested in learning more about this topic, Dr. McLaughlin has provided a reference list of sources that I will list in the video description, which you can use to learn more about the topic. I will also invite you to fill out a quick survey linked beneath the video in that same video description, which will take you no more than five minutes to fill out, which will help us gather feedback about the specific topic. This survey will provide us with valuable information that will help us in the formation of future presentations like this one. Lastly, should you have any questions regarding the presentation itself, Dr. McLaughlin has made his email available so that you may contact him with any questions or comments that you may have. Additionally, please do contact Nehoff with any questions or if you're interested in learning more about the organization and its work. Nehoff's contact information is available on the screen. Once again, I'd like to thank Dr. McLaughlin for providing a program for Black History Matters. I would also like to thank you, the audience, for joining us on this educational journey. Please remember that we will be releasing a video each day of this February, and we hope to see you at our next presentation. Thank you.